Tonight we're going to be hearing from Eddie Beck. Eddie is a recent graduate of the University of Georgia Math Program. He's been very involved with the math community here. He's been a tutor, a researcher, of course a student, and he's actually been uh, an officer in the math club as well several years ago. Um, so for all those reasons, we're very pleased to, to have him here tonight giving his final talk as a, as a I don't know, math club person. And um, so yeah, without further ado, please help me in welcoming Eddie Beck uh, and, and his talk on how it tore the math community apart and drove one man insane. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, and thank you to the math club for um, for for having me. Um, so right, so this this talk um, started off in in quotes. I was taking qualitative ordinary differential equations with uh, with Dr. Azoff, and um, he was telling us about the Cantor set, which uh, is this uh, set that has all of these amazing properties. And that day in class, just like blew my mind. And so I promptly, uh, you know, did what any good American would have done under those circumstances, which was promptly go and Google and find out all that I can about uh, Cantor. And then um, in the process of doing that, I ended up finding out a lot about the legend of Cantor as opposed to the reality of Cantor. Uh, and the, the, which is probably the reason why, uh, which is the reason why um, this talk is slightly, is slightly mis- um, the, the title of the talk is slightly misleading, but we will we will go into that. Um, so I want to so so what was I researching? I was talking about the history of infinity, and uh, so before before Cantor, we had um, we just thought of infinity as sort of like a, of limits. Infinity is just this thing that's that's bigger than all of the other that's that's bigger than all the other natural uh, all the other real numbers, and. Uh, and in, in the context of this talk, we're gonna that's we sort of refer to that as potential infinity. Um, the, for the first part of this talk, I want to sort of go a little light on the math content, and uh, because like the story of what happened is like e true Hollywood like kind of level drama. It's it's kind of cool. But so but just a little piece of, of mathematics that we need before we get started on this fun, dramatic, historic tale, is that, um, so, so Cantor first started uh, dealing with sets and talking about, you know, the size of these sets, and um, the, was able to show that all of these different sets had the same size infinity. The prime numbers, the natural numbers, the rational numbers, and even the algebraic numbers were all the same size of infinity. And at this point, when we start our story, the, we, you know, he's sort of wrestling with the ideas, is there one infinity or are there multiple sizes of infinity? Um, now, the, I forgot when this was. This was in the, the 1800s, I think 18, why well, am I even gonna make it up? So, in the, <laughs> from the late 1800s, um, the, the Cantor ended up proving that there were bigger infinities. And um, this, this um, was something that was very controversial at the time. The, the, because he's he's here talking about you know these actual these actual infinities and sort of making arguments about them, uh, which weren't very accepted at the time. But and the title of the paper that he ended up uh, publishing this in was on the properties of a set of all real algebraic numbers. It was completely uncontroversial. It was very low key and didn't really talk about what this big result was that he just made. Now, why might you ask? Um, his former professor uh, that he was working under, um, there were several uh, mathematical badasses at the time that were really, really into, you know, these finite notions of infinity. That all mathematics should be done, you know, in sort of a finite way. Should be able to be expressed in a finite way. We shouldn't deal with. Uh, they were very scared of this notion of of infinity. And one of them was uh, his former professor uh, Leopold Kronecker. Now, just to give you an idea of of how uh, important Kronecker was then, if um, for those of you who have, who have taken abstract algebra, or who will take abstract algebra, the Kronecker's theorem, after <coughs> this guy, um, is is the theorem that tells us that any polynomial over over um, with coefficients over a field, there exists 
a bigger field that we can construct that has zeros to that polynomial. And so this sort of gives us you know, the, the existence of the complex numbers when we have the reals and a whole bunch of other really, really interesting, powerful mathematics. Um, and then uh, Henry Poincaré, um, oh, what, what did, how did, um, Hey Eddie, if we could dim or turn off the front lights, then oh, the... yeah, this was this was this is called the opposite of what. Yeah. There we go. Great. Right on. Um, so yeah, so Kronecker was was uh, so was active at the same time that 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 Cantor was and was saying all sorts of horrible things about about him and the mathematics that he was doing. Called him a scientific charlatan, a renegade, and. Um, and a corrupter of youth. Um, <laughs> I, I wish. I wish. So uh, there's there's one historian that that uh, I I basically studied a lot to get the information for this talk, and I really want to sit down with him and ask him a whole bunch of questions like, what does a mathematician do to sort of constitute to earn the title of a corrupter of youth? Like I'm, I have questions. Um, I have several of those. I'll I'll share them with you. But Henry. Uh, Poincaré, he's like the grandfather. I mean, he did a whole bunch of really groundbreaking mathematics, um, but I think he's most known for being like the grandfather of topology. You know, recently the, the Poincaré conjecture just got solved. That was after him. That was one of the Millennium Prizes. It's, uh, it's a big deal. And he uh, referred to Cantor's ideas as a grave disease that was infecting the discipline of mathematics. So, um, so how does Cantor respond to this? Cantor did uh, several things that on one side, sort of like within the mathematical community, he um, the he was making these very impassioned arguments about on one side saying that his his mathematics was internally consistent, there was no contradictions, which was um, one of the concerns that the other that the other mathematicians, I mean, part of the reasons why the other mathematicians were so interested in like sort of sticking with finite with finite math was that dealing with infinities sloppily, without rigor, without being careful, sort of opens you up to potential dangerous paradoxes. Um, and you know, the old, the old guard mathematicians were concerned that if we did this, then we might destroy the discipline of mathematics. Um, and so, so at, that, at one point he was saying that we should be internally consistent, and then on the other side he was saying that we should you know, he was arguing that we should be dispassionate and objective when we talked about mathematics, which is kind of hilarious that we would that he would have to say that now for me because back in the day, you know, it's it's just really sort of shocking to me that you know people would. I mean, I feel like they just fell short of like insulting Cantor's mother. You know what I mean? Like with these kind of like uh, epithets that they were throwing around. Um, but he he proposed this idea, and sort of within that context, he was instead of using this. You know, talking about pure mathematics, he was talking about free mathematics. Mathematics that's free from um, biases of the past, free from subjective um, sort of emotional reactions, and you know, in the way that pure mathematics is free from, I don't know, physicists doing terrible things with it. Um, right, um, the free in that way as well. Um, this, however, was not well received by uh, the mathematicians of, uh, of the day. And um, so at the same time, the Catholics uh, weigh in on this. And the, they're really concerned. The Catholic Church, well, not the Catholic Church, but theologians in the Catholic Church were really concerned about uh, the mathematics that Cantor was, uh, was developing by saying that there was that, that we could have this actual infinity as opposed to this potential infinity, actual infinity that we can actually work with, um, threatened the idea, sort of the, the monotheistic ideas that were were central to not just Catholicism, but Christianity, um, and the the um, right. And so these theologians were saying that there's one and only one actual infinity, and that is God himself. And um, to say that there was multiple infinities, um, the, the uh, support of this idea of pantheism, that God is, is everywhere and in everything, and it's borderline polytheistic, which upset a lot of the sensibilities of, of um, 
the, the Catholic, uh, Catholic theologians of the time. Now, what, sort of to take a moment to sort of look, to realize, you know, where, I don't know, I guess to just confess my biases when I, you know, through, as we go through this material, like, this is, this is a photograph from the talk that, um, oh my god, I forgot his name, what's his name, Ham? Oh, I know Bill Nye, but what's the other guy? <laughs> Bill, what? Ken Ham, there we go. Oh. <laughs> I feel terrible. I knew there was a pig involved, but like. <laughs> anyway, uh, and so like this is the I, I sort of point to this is I feel like this is the, the shining example of this moment right now of this contentious relationship that exists between science and uh, and religion. And I thought for sure, like looking at the the events that happened in the 1800s, you know, the church was going to be having um, a lot of host, you know, that, that the church and Cantor were going to be like completely. Um, at each other's throats on this uh, uh, on this issue, but what actually happened was um, I was I was very surprised by what happened. Um, so Pope Leo the Thirteenth was the Pope at the time. Um, though he was not a Jesuit, he was taught by the Jesuits. Um, for the people who aren't like up on Catholic history, um, Pope Francis is also a Jesuit, and he's the first Pope who was sort of part of that. Um, that order of Catholics that that um, became Pope, and I don't know for people who are sort of like aware of how different Pope Francis is from, you know, from Pope Benedict and other sort of popes in recent history. I mean, there was a little bit of that um, difference as as well with him. So anyway, uh, right, the Catholic Church and the science of our souls. So he argued that the um, so. I guess with every you know religious leader, we're, we're worried about the concerns of, of the day. Um, you know, every day it's the morality of, of the world is going straight to hell, and sort of need to figure out how to save the world. And but the arguments that he made was that he had, he argued that the church had to enter the current of <coughs> modern times or be left behind. And to do that, he said that, um, and this was what blew my mind: is that contemporary evils were the result of false philosophy improper and incorrect views of nature resulted in two consequences, atheism and materialism. And you sort of think about this as this is somewhat in stark contrast to the debate between between Bill Nye and and the the ham. Um, the the that the church is looking to science, to philosophy, to nature, and discovering these scientific truths in order to I mean I really wish so one of the things that kind of frustrated me about uh, researching this was that, um, you know, when I wanted to like dig deeper into, like, I really wanted to hear what Pope uh, Pope Leo XIII had to say about this stuff, but you know, it's in Latin. <laughs> um, so, though Cantor's work was not immediately embraced, it was it was very carefully studied and uh, finally accepted by prominent figures in the church um, as not posing any theological problem. And um, how that argument happened is very philosophy, and we use lots of big philosophical words that I had difficulty understanding. But uh, I mean, the happy ending of that story was even though like not everyone in the church ended up being won over, enough people in the church got got won over that that. Um, that they didn't think that uh, Kronecker's uh, work posed a threat to, to um, pose any theological problems. And, um, and sort of keep in mind at this time when, <coughs> so uh, Cantor is being somewhat blacklisted from the mathematical community at this, at this point. He can't do that much work uh, in the mathematical community and he's not being able to really convince anyone that he's not insane in the mathematical <coughs> community. And so on the other side, there's all of these philosophers and theologians who are willing to work with him. And um, I think that's, I mean, it's really interesting to me that uh, the church ended up playing such a crucial role as they did in bringing his mathematical ideas to light. Since, you know, at the time they were the only people who were, you know, really willing to have that discussion with him. And Cantor and some others uh, considered his work as adding to the, to the understanding of the infinitude of God. Um, so I guess this sort of segues also into um, the 
the cantor was also a very religious person. And um, so, so I go back to, to my title where I said, infinity, you know, the part where it drove one man insane. <laughs> um, the, the sort of the legend of Cantor was that he was driven nuts by this drama that happened in, in the, the mathematical community, that he was driven nuts by, you know, the, the backlash that he was getting from, from Kronecker and Poincaré. But that turns out not to be true. And I'm going to make that argument that, um, that he wasn't driven mad by that, that, you know, he was kind of crazy to start off with. Um, um, so one thing that, um, that people who make the argument that, that Cantor was driven nuts by, um, by these arguments sort of point to some of the things that he said as being a deeply religious person um, that I think are taken out of context. Like, for example, he said, he said that he was uh, commanded by God to pursue his work in, in set theory and pursue his work in, in studying infinity and that, um, and another point, he said that that his ideas were communicated to him <coughs> by God directly, and that he was he was just the messenger, sort of speaking, you know, speaking the message that he he got from God. Now, at first, you know, that that sounds crazy. You know, that sounds like homies hearing voices. Um, but uh, there's very so just as a side note, there's very little historical precedent for that, that when people hear voices that they actually make up math that makes sense. Um, the, but I'm going to, again, this is one of the questions that I, I, I would have for, for the historians, was that is, so I'm gonna propose that, you know, what he was saying, I mean, this was like in the 1800s, and so I think the way we talk about our faith and we talk about religion has potentially changed a little bit in the last you know, 150, 200 years. And that what he was saying then might be comparable not to you know, us hearing voices today, but might actually be comparable to you know, people having a calling you know, from, to be compelled by their sort of religious devotion to carry out. I mean, because that does, you know, that, we don't call people crazy for doing, doing that uh, today. Or, yes. Um, so right, so the what was so I did promise that that uh, Cantor was crazy, though not not for the reasons that all the, a lot of the legend and the the uh, sort of popular historians sort of talk about uh, today. Um, so the most modern his, uh, historical accounts think that that Cantor was bipolar. Now, what's important to keep in mind? Of, well, I don't know. One of the things that I find really interesting about this is that um, the bipolar. Uh, manic depression was first described in, in the psychological literature in the 1850s, around the same time that, that Cantor was, was beginning his career. But it wasn't actually written into the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychological Disorders, the Dictionary of Psychiatry, until 1950, well after Cantor had moved on to, had dipped out, had, had died. I don't know why I couldn't say passed away. Um, like for example, like lithium for example was a was um, like the first medication used to treat bipolar, but lithium wasn't the first time lithium was used to treat that was 1949. Um, but and so one of the other things that I find really interesting about this was how um, Cantor's take on on his um, manic depression. Um, the, he didn't sort of see it so much as this uh, debilitating, you know, he didn't sort of see, see himself as being crazy in a debilitating sort of way. But, uh, so this was a, uh, the, this is a quote from, from a letter that he wrote in uh, 1908. This was three years before he died. And again, the, the stuff that I was reading wasn't entirely sure, but I'm like 85% sure that he wrote this from an insane asylum when he was uh, sort of recovering from one of his depressive episodes. So um, he said, a peculiar fate, which thank, thank goodness has in now no way broken me, but in fact has made me stronger inwardly, happier and more expectantly joyful than I have ever been in a couple of years, has kept me far from home, and I can say also far from the world. But in my lengthy isolation, neither mathematics nor in particular my work on infinity has slept or lain fallow in me. And there's some, some typos in there. But, um, but the... The point here is that 
the while he was having you know these depressive episodes and while he had to sort of step away from you know the the I guess day-to-day -day mathematical work that he was doing, he was um, you know in these in like a hospital meditating on on his work and um, you know he made the argument here that, that he never that that his work was never far from his mind that he he in a I didn't actually quote this, but um, in another place, he sort of says that that he used these times to you know to pray and reflect, and actually became you know these used these times to have a clearer, better understanding of mathematics. And what and one of the things so this strikes me as really interesting because you know we all saw a beautiful mind. Do you see a beautiful mind? Beautiful mind. So right. So John Nash. I mean, one of the the big sort of um, aspects of that story was John Nash was a mathematical genius in spite of his uh, madness. And George Cantor was a mathematical genius and attributed a lot of, you know, some of his success to uh, what we now consider uh, a psychological disorder. And I thought that that was, I don't really know where to take that, but it, it sounds deep.